Welcome to Zoo Town Church. We're glad you're here. Looking for more ways to stay connected with the zoo? Download the app. You can find it on any Windows, Apple, or Android device. On the app, you can view past sermons and share the content directly to your social media. This is a great way to help preach the gospel to Missoula and beyond. If you can't make it to a service, you can also watch live stream directly on your phone. Make sure to check out all the extra content as well, like the Year of the Word reading plan and the interactive notes. Interactive notes are actually prepared by the pastors for their individual sermons. You can also add your own notes into the mix. So head over to the App Store, download the app, and we hope you enjoy the message. Well, as I mentioned, thank you guys for being here today, and this is our last uh, sermon, last Sunday in our series, Summer of Love. We've been walking through the book of 1 John all summer, which is kind of known as the love book, but the reason he had to write this book was because the church had kind of gotten all confused. They let these outside voices come in and kind of steer them in the wrong direction, so it's actually kind of an intense book, but he writes it all in love, um, and today is the finale of that. And today, I guess I want you to know that it's going to seem a little sporadic in this sermon, so way different than all my other sermons, but it's, I literally could have spent a week on each one of these little passages, um, but in order to, you know, get through the series, but also I saw the connection of them too, so it's going to seem like he's jumping around, but they all are connected, but I, I feel like John kind of realized this letter was going long, and, and he had to wrap it up. He had to bring it all together, and, and he wanted them to get this main point. And it's kind of like, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but like when you're text messaging, like kind of an intense conversation with somebody, like texting is a wonderful way to make a quick point. It's a horrible way to talk long, you know, because you end up like having to go back and read. And, and I've always said texting is hard because you can't, like you don't know any emotion. You can't tell like body language. You can't tell like, you know, the, the tone in which it's said. And me and my wife, we have this one thing where, and we even call it a swear word. There's a swear word in the clout house, and it's sure. Don't ever say sure to my wife, because when you're texting it too, like the word sure to me, like I'll text sure, and she's like, what's your problem, man? I'm like, I said sure, because she took it like, sure. And I'm like, sure, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's a great way to like get quick points, but it's not a great way to communicate. But we've all been in that text conversation where it's kind of going and going and going, and you're like, okay, we got to wrap this up. So you want to just drive home that main point. And so you kind of write a little phrase, never works, because then they fire back and it just keeps going. But this is really like John. John's trying to get this whole book that he's written into like one main thing to send him home with. And so he starts in chapter 5, this is what, or in verse 13, this is what he wants them to know. And this is amazing. He says, I've written this letter to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you will be assured and know without a doubt that you have eternal life. Without a doubt that you have eternal life. This is what he wants them to know. This is what he wants them to go home with. Like, he wants them to have an assurance. He wants them to have a confidence that they know without doubt out of doubt, that they are still in Christ. Because again, they were totally confused. They were all messed up. And this is us. Like all these life things happen, all these like some hard things happen. And we instantly say, is God mad at us? Is, have we done something? And so we need to know that we have this assurance because there is this, there's this human desire to be assured. Like we want to be assured of our future. We want to be assured of our money. We want to be assured everything's going to work out fine. There is this thing in us that like craves this assurance. And the companies, the American companies know this. Like they play on our fears. Because I mean, have you noticed that like you can literally get insurance on anything now? Like you'll go to any store and they're like, you want to buy insurance on that? And I'm like, it's a muffin. Like what did you think I'm going to do with this? You know? But this is true. Like a couple of years, like, a couple of years ago, uh, I had to buy a cord and hook my phone up to my truck. And it was like an $8 cord. And the guy's like, you want insurance on that? And I'm like, it's a, he's like a dollar, another dollar and you'll get insurance. He looked at me like I'm stupid for not getting it. I'm like, dude, it's an $8 cord. Of course, a year later, it broke. I should have got the insurance. But there's something like about us that, that wants that assurance in our life. And I, I was looking this up and I didn't even know this, but celebrities now are getting insurance, not assurance, insurance on their body parts. Because, like, it's how they make their money. Listen to some of these crazy things that these celebrities are doing. So Gene Simmons, lead singer of Kiss, you know, that guy. I will never do that again. Uh, he has a $1 million insurance policy on his tongue. That's just creepy, guy. Like, that's just kind of weird. David Beckham, he's that super ugly soccer player. <laughs> My wife loves him. I'm not bitter at all. 
He has a $195 million insurance policy on his legs. What'd you say? Yep. You seen him? You like him? That's what you're saying that for? <laughs> no, he's, like, he's a soccer player, right? And so, like, he's a model. And so he's, if he gets hurt playing soccer, $195 million for his legs. Troy Polamanu, he was the safety for the Steelers. He did all those, like, head and shoulders commercials. He's got glorious head of hair. He has a $1 million insurance policy on his hair. I should have got that. <laughs> this church would look way different. Tom Jones, he's an old singer. This is one of my favorites. He has a $7 million insurance policy on his chest hair. Because he always wears shirts unbuttoned. And like, my wife's an esthetician. People pay her to wax that crap off. And he's trying to keep it on. It's super weird. America Ferrara has a $10 million one on her teeth. This is hands down my favorite, though. Is Jennifer Lopez has a $27 million insurance policy on her butt. What's going to happen to your butt? <laughs> like, just go to the gym, right? You just got to go to the gym. And like, I couldn't believe that that's how much her butt was worth. $27 million. But there's this like insurance, right? They want to have that assurance. They want to know that like everything's going to be okay if something bad happens. That's exactly kind of what John is saying here. He's saying like the whole reason that I wrote this book was so you guys could be assured of your future, that it's good, that no matter what, you have a guarantee that your life in Christ is secure. And I do love his style here because remember, this church is all kinds of screwed up that he's writing it to. And we can learn from this. Instead of writing them and being like, you guys are screwed. <laughs> I mean, you got so many people leaving now and they've been totally he's like, man, are you guys even Christians? Like, are you, I mean, do you even know what's going on? He does the opposite. He actually just says, I want you to know that even though you've been through some seasons of doubt, and even though you've had some turmoil, even though there's some division in this church, it does not affect who you are in Christ. And this is an amazing reality that he's trying to get across to us as well. Because what he's saying is, your father, you, 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 you have Father God, and you're his kids. And every kid needs to know Father loves them, that they're protected, and that they have assurance in him. I was reading this thing from the Mental Institute of America, and they just did this whole study on what makes a good household, what, what, what kind of household the kids need to live in. And they say, you have to have rules in a household because they've studied all these different houses that don't, and it screws all these kids up, and I think that's biblical somewhere, right? So you have to have rules. But the main thing they said a kid needs is love and security and acceptance should be the heart be at the heart of every family life. Children need to know that your love does not depend on his or her accomplishments. That's biblical. See, science always catches up with the Bible. It always does. Mistakes and or defeats should be expected and accepted. This is the crazy part. Confidence grows in a home that is full of unconditional love and affection. It has nothing to do with your money. It has nothing to do with where you're at in you know, status. Confidence grows. And again, aren't we always just telling our kids, like, you're amazing, like, you're the best. Some of you are like, I never tell my kids that. <laughs> but like, aren't we always telling our kids that? They say, well, that's good. But the number one thing that gives a child confidence is that they know they can depend on you and that you love them and that you accept them. That is what John is trying to tell us. Because as old as we get, and the older we get in Christ, sometimes we think we're going to like move on, you know, to these new things. And he's saying, no, I don't care if you're 60, 70, 80, doesn't matter. The main thing you need to know is that you are loved and accepted by your father, no matter how old you get. And this is an incredible reality that we all need to grasp, because here's one of the problems with Christianity. I'm not saying this church, but as a whole, is it has become a shameful place sometimes. Because we're constantly looking at the outside. We're constantly judging people's actions. We're constantly like ranking Christians. And so religion sweeps in, shame creeps in, and we start like getting, I mean, this is true. Some denominations, some people believe that like you basically lose your salvation every day depending on how you acted. Well, why did we need Jesus then? And so, so many people, this is important. You will live your whole Christian life without the Holy Spirit power-filled way that we should be living because you're so concerned if you're in or out, in or out, in or out. And when you're thinking that, you know who you're thinking of? You. You're constantly just thinking about yourself. And so you're constantly, you never have that assurance. And again, this whole series has been him basically receive God's love, and then you love others, receive God's love. You can't love others because you have even received the love of God. And we become cynical, we become angry, all those different things if we don't have the assurance from Christ. 
And they even said these kids that they're studying, um, if they don't get that at home, they do go get it other places. They will, there's something in us that needs this assurance and it's money, drugs, or some sort of relationship. As we get older, it's the same way. If we do not find that assurance and that acceptance and that confidence in Christ, we will go to other places to find it. But we weren't designed that way. I love what Bill Johnson says. He says, royalty is my identity. Servanthood is my assignment. And intimacy with God is my life source. Those are three, if we could just get those three down, like royalty. Like you are a king and queen in the kingdom of God. But being a king and queen is not lording it over people. It's servanthood. Servanthood is our assignment. But then the source of life is in God. That's what John's saying here. We have to get this as Christians or else we are going to live our whole lives like just totally confused on who we are in Christ. So John just drives this point. But then he kind of makes a weird turn here. But it's connected. He says, since we have this confidence. What kind of confidence? Confidence that your father loves you and that you're in Christ. And that nothing can ever change that. No sin, no decision, no nothing can ever change that. So what he's saying is, if you have this confidence in Christ, we can also have great boldness before him. For if we present any request agreeable to his will, he will hear us. He's talking about prayer. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we also know that we have obtained the requests asked of him. Now, I know that that passage right there causes a ton of frustration with you and with me. Because we think what it's saying is if we just ask anything and if we're in Christ, then we're going to get it. I have not found that to be the case. And I want you to know I've read probably five to ten books on prayer. I preached, a, Pastor Kyle and I preached a whole summer series on the Lord's Prayer. And I still don't really know exactly how this works. I think back to my daughter. My daughter was born with really bad colic. She didn't sleep. I mean, it was bad, it was bad, bad. We didn't sleep. And I tell people this, they don't believe me. It was years. As soon as she gets over colic, she goes right into night terrors. And we would be up night after night after night after night. And I would be in my garage at three in the morning, like just pleading with God. I mean, I said a lot of naughty words at three in the morning. I never cussed at God, but it was where I was at, man. It's what I was feeling. It was real. And God's a big boy. He could take it. And I sat there and pleaded with God and pleaded with God and pleaded with God. And it wasn't changing. And then she has anxiety from it. And she, was, she had such bad anxiety. At two or three years old, she was eating her nails to the nubs. Like she freaked out all the time. She wouldn't leave my wife's side. And we would plead and we would plead and we would plead. And it seemed like nothing changed. And then we invited this one guy over to our house. And, and he was a prayer warrior. He came in. He prayed over her room, prayed over our house. And her night terror stopped from that day forward. Why didn't God hear my prayers? I don't know. I don't know. But what I do know is my daughter loves her some Jesus. And what I do know is my daughter is one of the most spiritually aware kids that I have ever met in my life. Do I think God gave it to her? No. God's the giver of life, not sickness and death. And it's a part of living in this world, and it's a part of, and trust me, me and my wife instantly went to like shame and guilt, like, well, what do we do to deserve this? What do we do to let our daughters like this? It had to be because I was such a loser in college. It had to be all this stuff. And God's just like, wow, you really think that about God? But something happened to me and something happened to her and it, God used it. But we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. I do think when I see this though, John is giving us a clue here. Because if you follow the pattern of what he's talking about, he's saying if you have assurance in your Savior, it will equal confidence in your prayer life. See, I think we've done a disservice as Christians that we have made prayer kind of this like formula thing. If you say the right words, if you say them loud enough, I've always laughed when people like yell at Satan. I'm like, you think Satan's afraid of a loud word? Jesus, just help us today and bind Satan. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> Satan's like, Ooh. but there's something that happened to us. And if you just declare the right words or say, I mean, you really, I just, I can't, if you believe that, I'm not making fun of you. I mean, it's like, but is that Father God being like, okay, just say it in the right tone. Say it at this time of day. I don't think that's what he's saying here. I think what he's saying is that as you get confidence in your eternal savior and you grow in him and you mature in him, you start praying differently. 
Because he said, according to his will, it's still dad, he's still father. You start praying differently. And you, start, you stop praying about certain things and you start praying about other things and you just get this relationship and this closeness to God the more you have assurance in him. And here's what I know, is he said, no matter what you pray, I hope you know that God hears you. He never, he said, no matter what you say, there isn't a block. He hears every single request you make. See, I'm a father and I love my kids so much. But like, I think it's a guy thing, right? Like, like, you women are amazing. Women, you can like be thinking about so many different things and doing so many different things at one time. I'm just like a squirrel, just whoa. Like, I'm just stuck on one thing. Like, my wife can know what's going on in the neighbor's house upstairs, and I'm on the couch like, huh? Like, what? Like, it, you have a gift. And my kids, I love that they want to come to me and ask me things all the time. I love that they can come to their daddy. But there's times when I'm focused on something, and they run in, and it's... And I'm like, oh. and then the other one comes in, no, 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 no. and I'm just like, oh my gosh, it's happening. And I don't get like angry, but it does kind of get frustrating because I'm a flawed human. But what John says is there's never that block with Father God, ever. And that we need to have this confidence. What about that boldness? Like my kids are bold in coming and asking me things. They're bold in needing help. They're bold in coming to me. And I'm not against having humility with God, but I think sometimes we're kind of like, Yes, God, if, hey, are you there? And he's like, bust in the room, you're his kid. And again, we try to make this like, I'm all for you having your morning prayer time. You should, and I sit on my porch at night for my evening prayer time. But do you really think Father God's up there being like, if they would just pray at four in the morning, I would do this. <laughs> my time is at eight o'clock at night. I don't know if you kids knew that. It's all day, man. It's all day, and it's always talking. It's bringing all these things to him. One man says this, prayer is not trying to get what you want, but what God wants for us. I'm gonna read that one again. Prayer is not trying to get what you want, but what God wants for us. And as I've matured now in Christ and I've grown in Christ, I totally ask him for everything and, and bring everything to him, but it's more of like a guidance and a suggestion. It's more like, Lord, if this is it, if that's it, I mean, I need your help. I need your guidance. And see, here comes the next question, though, that I want to answer, which I really can't. Why even pray if he already knows? Most of us have asked that, and most people struggle with that. Why even pray if he already knows the answer? Well, why do kids start asking for Christmas presents in July? <laughs> Literally, my kids are already coming to me being like, I want this, this, and this, and they got it all mapped out. And I'm like, what month is this? It's like August. But I love it. I love that they will come to me. They know I'm good. They know I want to do it. Do I do everything? No. But they will ask me for everything. But I'm the father. I know them. I know timing. I know all that stuff. But you know what really bummed me out? Is if my kids only talked to me when they wanted something. It would bum me out in September or in December. They're like, okay, I just want this. And then I didn't get to talk to them really ever. I couldn't go a day without talking to my kids. I'm going to be that dad. I'm going to be that dad every day. I'm into my 60s or 70s. Like, Ethan, what's up, man? How's it going? I'm just driving to work, dad. I know, right? Let's talk for a little bit. You know, like, I'm going to be that dad. So that's what I think he's saying. It's this relationship and this is timing and sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says no. I mean, a couple years ago, my son asked for an iPad because Lily got an iPad. He was three. And he was like huffing and puffing. Little man, what's up? I love that guy. That's my man. He gives the best hugs at the door. But you know, he was all like, come on, Lily got an iPad. I'm like, you're three years old, bro. Well, he finally turned six and we got him an iPad. But you know what else we got him? We got him a whole thing of Legos too, so he doesn't melt his brain. I want him to still be creative. And they're doing mass studies now on if you let your little kids play too much iPad, it's like expecting their emotions, like that stimulation. So we give little certain times of the day. We block them off after a while. Like we, we wanted to give him that, but we also still are, I'm his father. I still know best. But I love that he asked for it. So here's another thing is, do I believe? Am I telling you not to ask for things? Am I telling you not to just, you know, ask for what you want? Of course not. He's our daddy. And here's something that I believe that you might not believe. That's okay. But I actually believe God changes his mind sometimes. 
I believe that God has an overall plan of redemption and I believe in revelation and all that stuff, but I think it's just like we have a plan for our children. All of us have a plan for our kids, but there's many surprises along the way. And we direct him down this certain path and I think he's so good that no matter what, he will meet you on that other road and get you on that right road because that's, he's, he's, that's what he does. But I don't think he's above changing his mind like, yeah, all right, I'll do that. But maybe you should ask. I see this in the Old Testament. Abraham pleaded with God for the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and the righteous people and God listened. You see it with Moses when he wanted to destroy him. I mean, like, you see this and I think the greatest example to me is Jesus Christ, his first miracle. When he was gonna turn water into wine, he was at a wedding and his mama comes in. She's a smart mama. She's like, uh, you know, Jesus, they're out of wine. Party's about to die. And he's like, what is that to me? My time has not come. Jesus said that. So Mary just says, well, do whatever he says. And he walks off and Jesus did it. So what I think happened is Jesus had a talk with dad and dad said, eh, we'll make it the right time. That's, to me, that is such a better way of relationship with father. And yes, he says no. Sometimes he says yes. I mean, he does. And before I move on from this, I want you to know, because again, some of you are still struggling because you have people who are sick in your family or you're sick. I think often what we do is when we pray and we pray and we pray, we make it so personal because it should be. Those are your kids, that's your family, your brother, your wife. It's so personal to us. And oftentimes we miss that, that God is doing something in that person's life who is sick or going through financial troubles or whatever it is. We do make it so personal, and we should. And I'm not telling you to stop praying. Keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. But what I started to do now is I just, I started doing like what Paul did. If you ever see Paul write these letters to the people who were all like going through persecution, he never once prayed for their persecution to end. I never see that. Or when he was in jail, he never prayed to get out of jail. He always prayed that he drew nearer to the Father and the Father to him in those times. And so now, yes, you should pray for sick people. You should ask for healing but then you have a trust and a confidence that your father is good and that your father is working on something that we don't even see. And you just keep coming to him and coming to him in that confidence and that boldness. Then he makes another turn. Again, remember, this is his last text message. He's like, I'm trying to get all this out to you guys. But he's, in the, he's talking about prayer now, confidence and prayer. If anyone observes a fellow believer habitually sinning in a way that doesn't lead to death, you should keep interceding in prayer that God will give that person life. Now there is a sin that leads to death, and I'm not encouraging you to pray for those who commit it. All unrighteousness is sin, but there is sin that does not result in death. Now there are a lot of smart people who have debated what that sin is. And it's funny, because don't we kind of want to know? Like, I don't want to do that one, because you'll, you'll die from it. There are so many smart men and women that I've read on this, and they have so many different views of what this is. My personal view in looking at the context of this passage, and I just preached on it last week, was this church was all screwed up. They let false beliefs come in, and some of them left the church. Some of them were mad at the church. Some of them followed false things. They basically denied the Lord Jesus Christ. I think he's talking about people who have done that. I think he's talking about people who are just like, forget Zootown, or forget this church, or forget that, and like, you know what? I just, I don't even believe this anymore. I think he's talking about them, but I don't think he's being a jerk about it, because Paul talked about people leaving. Jesus had his own disciples in John 6, somewhere around there. It says many of his disciples left, because they loved it when he was feeding them, but as soon as he started talking about some sin and stuff, they were like, whoa. So I think sometimes when people want to leave, he seconds their motion. And I, he didn't say you couldn't pray for him. He just says you don't have to. But I don't even think that's harsh. What he's doing there is he's saying, let them go that way so they come to the end of themselves. Every person that I know who ever leaves, they never get more joyful. They get more cynical. They get more bitter. They get more angry. They get more gossiping, uh, gossiping slanderous. <laughs> That's where they go. And so he's like, dude, back up. Because you know what won't bring them back? <sighs> and so he's turning them over to Jesus. And Jesus is a long-suffering Christ. And we know from the prodigal son story and all those sheep stories, he goes after those who are lost. So I'm, I'm, I'm the guy who steps back and says, let them go. Jesus, you got him. Because he's way more grace-filled than I am. They don't need Scotty up in their face. They need Jesus restoring them. Paul had this happen all the time, all the time. Paul would come, plant a church. He'd leave after a couple years. Then this other group would come in and they'd just trash Paul because he's stupid and all that stuff, just like today. Listen to how he said he fought it. Of course, we are human, but we don't fight like humans. 
The weapons we use in our fight are not made by humans. Rather, they are powerful weapons from God. With them, we destroy people's defenses, that is, their arguments and all their intellectual arrogance that oppose the knowledge of God. What he's talking about is our lives. What he's talking about is the weapons of the Lord. And again, we live in a society in a world where everything's intelligence, everything's about advancement, human advancement. How's the world doing? We got lots of science. We got lots of stuff. How's it going out there? It's going great. Going real good. As one pastor said, science has given us life to our years to our life, but not life to our years. And I kind of agree with that in one sense, but medication does help people who are suffering, so I don't fully agree on that. But I get what he's saying. And so what Paul is saying is like, look, how, what are we gonna use against this, you know, these arguments? Well, it's our life. Love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, all that stuff. So they see it and they're like, I want that. I want that, because whatever I'm doing out there is not making me any happier. So I think what we do is when we, as we debate, <laughs> as we debate which sin causes death, we miss the whole point. I think the whole point of what John was trying to tell us is you know how you combat that, or you go with people who are cynical or angry or mean? You pray for them. Surprise! And what we miss there is, you know what's not going to bring anybody back to the faith? Is you yelling at them and judging them and critiquing them. Arrogance and cynicism is not going to bring people back to the faith. It's love, joy, peace, kindness. It's acceptance. It's inviting them to dinner. It's loving them. Imagine how it would change if we prayed more than we taught. Imagine how it would change if we prayed more than we slandered. Us Christians, I say us, we're good at this, man. We're good. We know how to hide our gossip. Have you heard what's going on with so-and-so? We need to pray for them. Have you heard this, 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 and this about this person? Man, we should be praying for them. And then do you ever just stop and say, yeah, let's pray for them. We're like, all right, I'll see you at dinner tonight. It's a fake way to hide gossip and slander. And he says, if you are really serious and you really have a heart for people, you will be praying and interceding for them. Billy Graham says, it is the Holy Spirit's job to convict, God's job to judge, and my job to love. Again, he's talking about confidence in eternal salvation so you know your daddy's really good and then boldness in prayer. So what that means connected to this is you know your daddy's hearing when you pray for those people. Here's what I know about Jesus. Jesus said when he went to the cross, he will draw all men to himself. I think that means everybody. And he also said, it is my father's will that all should come to repentance. I think that means everybody. And I think God gets his will. And so you put those two together and I'm here to tell you, all the prayers in the world that God hears that we're praying for other people, he wants it way worse than we do. And we are putting it in his hands and we are trusting that he's good and that he will do anything to bring those people back. You who have wayward children in here, keep praying. You who have some of you in here, you're here alone because your spouse won't come. You know what's gonna bring them to the faith is when they see the love and the joy and the acceptance of Jesus Christ in your life. You who have relatives, you who have unbelievers at work, whatever it is, it's not gonna be by spitting judgment at them and holy roller stuff. It's gonna be by prayer because you know I have confidence, man, Jesus, you want this guy in church way more than I do. So that's why I think he's bringing this all together. I think of my father. My father got cancer at 51. Six foot four, built like me, didn't smoke, didn't drink, worked out every day and got the worst kind of cancer you can get. Did God give my dad cancer? No. Sin does. This life does. It's the earth. But we prayed and we prayed and we prayed for my father to be healed and he died. But I'm here to tell you, my father got healed because he came back to Christ after 40 years of not living with Christ. He came back. And so God heard the prayers of my mother and God heard the prayers of my grandfather and my father came back to Christ when he was sick and he's in heaven today. Keep praying for those wayward people. Keep loving those wayward people because at one time or the other, I think we're all those people. 
And so he, this, that's the clue here. It's not about like, what sin is that? How can I call that sin out? It's like, how can I be praying that God intercedes in that person's life and know that he wants it more than we do? He makes another turn here. He says, we are convinced that everyone fathered by God does not make sinning a way of life because the son of God protects the child of God and the evil one cannot touch him. We know that we are God's children and that the whole world lies under the misery and influence of the evil one. Again, people who mock the Bible, like that's pretty evident right there. There's a lot of misery out there. And we know that the Son of God has made our understanding come alive so that we can know by experience the one who is true. And we are in him who is true, God's Son, Jesus Christ, the true God in eternal life, so little children, I love, he's writing it to grown adults, to little children, guard yourselves from worshiping anything but him. The end. Again, this is a passage, if you read that first line, this one scares us. We are convinced that everyone fathered by God does not make sinning a way of life. And right there, that's when our religious spirit kicks in, that's where Scotty's pride kicks in, and that's where shame and doubt kick in. Even though he already told you, you are secure in eternal life, because some of you are struggling so hard, and the first thing we do is we feel separated from God, and we think, oh my gosh, could I actually be a Christian and continue to do this? And you think, maybe I'm not fathered by God. And I used to think that because, I, I mean, I struggled. I still have sin, but I struggled hard in my first five years of Christianity. Like, it was hard coming from this party boy lifestyle into all of a sudden this, like, Bible dude. And I used to think, like, did it, was it real? Did it happen? And then the Lord totally just did a 180 on me, and he just pumped me up so much. He said, Scotty, if you weren't fathered by me, you wouldn't even be thinking about if it's right or wrong. And so let me give you some confidence in here, you who are majorly struggling with sin, and you've had them for years and years and years, and you just want it gone. It proves you're fathered by God because you're concerned about it. People who aren't fathered by God, they don't think about that stuff. They don't care if they're sinning. It's like when I was a little kid, right? When you were on the block, did you care what the neighbor dude down the street thought, or did you care what your daddy thought? So if you are struggling, yeah, he's gonna help you get over it. And he doesn't like it, but that proves, if you are aware of your struggles, if you are aware of your sins, that proves that you are fathered by God. To me, it's kind of like a bank account, right? Money is a stressful thing. It's a tangible thing that we have that we can stress about. And at the beginning of the month, when you get that check or whenever you get paid and you see it in your bank account, you kind of go, Whew. Don't you have more confidence when your bank account is full? But throughout the month, if you make a couple bad decisions that seemed really good at the time or over even years, swiping that credit card over and over and over, what does it bring? It brings fear and stress into your life. And what John is trying to say is your bank account with God is always full. It's always full. Again, as Christians, I've said this too. It's kind of like, Lord, fill me with your presence. He's like, I have. Give us more of you. I already have. We think God's a gas tank. He is not a gas tank. We are the gas tanks. And again, you might not agree with this. That's fine. I do. I've heard over and over and over in Christianity that sin separates us from God. I do not believe that one bit. I believe it's just like that bank account, a couple bad choices and all of a sudden fear comes into your life. I think what sin does is it gets you confidence low in who God is because you're so focused on this sin and these struggles instead of the power and the awesomeness of God. You feel like you're separated, but you are never separated from God. Adam and Eve sin, what happened? God instantly goes to the garden to be next to him. Jesus Christ walked this planet for three years. Do you ever see him once go to a sinner? All right, if you can get that stuff out of your life, then I'll come back. He runs up to them when they're sinning. Sin, this is why he says don't continue to sin. So the more sin you get out of your life, the more sin Jesus gets out of your life, the closer you will feel to God because you have this confidence in who he is. That word when he says Satan cannot touch you, the evil one cannot touch you. It comes from a Greek word that they, it's a powerful word where they would take papyrus and crinkle it up and light it on fire. And so essentially what he's saying is no matter what struggle you're going through in your life, well, no matter what sin you have in your life, if you are in Christ, Satan cannot light you on fire. 
because any good father protects his kids. No, fathers are supposed to protect their kids. And so what he's saying is, man, Jesus and the Father will protect you from any type of judgment or any type of eternal fire. It is in Christ. None of that. You will never be judged for your sin on this planet because it was on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So notice this confidence theme. What kind of confidence do we have in this? So some of you who are struggling hardcore with sexual sin, and you know you feel bad about it afterwards. Some of you who just, you want to get over pornography. You want to so bad, and you just feel terrible after doing it. I want you to know that shame and guilt is not Jesus. Jesus is whispering to you, there's more than this. And he is pleading with you to come back. You who are just saddled, saddled with guilt from the past, Jesus comes riding to you in grace and says, there's a future. Bob Goff writes this. You should read Bob Goff. He's awesome. He says, don't let who you were stop you from who you can become. It's a total trick. I played it for years and it sucks. Because this is why Jesus said it. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will have its own troubles. But that's so hard, right? We're always so worried about next week and next day and next year. And so how do we live as Christians? We freak out about tomorrow. We feel shame from the past and we don't enjoy today. And life just goes. And that's why Christ says eternal life is right now. It's not in the future. It's the kingdom life right now. My daughter just turned 10 like three weeks ago. And I looked at my wife and I said, our little girl is gone in eight years. I can't believe that. And I want to enjoy every minute with my child. And so does God with you. I got this letter that really just, it touched my heart, and it was from an inmate. I think I got all my tears out at the 8, 30, and 10, so I'm hoping I can get through this. He says, Dear Pastor Scott, my name is so-and-so, and I am 33 years old, and I am from Sealy Lake, Montana. I have been a screw-up my entire life, and I am searching for a major change. I was looking in the phone book for a phone number and came across Zootown Church. I was impressed he made it all the way to the Z's, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> and I was drawn to it, so I decided to write you a letter, and then I saw you and your wife in the Missoulian, and that was all the signs I needed. You think God's working in everything? We focus so much on negativity and politics and all that crap, and God's like, I'm using all of it. I have been in and out of the system since I was 14 years old. I don't want to do this anymore. I want a better life. I need to build a new foundation and it's near impossible for me because the only people in my address book are felons and nine out of 10 of them wouldn't be good for me. I am a recovering addict and have all the intentions to remain in recovery. I am writing to you to ask for a friend. Someone who can write me or come by the jail and be a positive influence for me and possibly give me some guidance <laughs> because I don't know how to be successful. <laughs> I've been a bad person my whole life. <laughs> but I don't want to be anymore, so I guess this is an SOS kind of letter to you. I am a Christian, and I have been baptized. I believe him. You don't write this. I believe him. But I have never stayed on the course that my heart wants to go. I have a craving to help others, but haven't been able to. And I feel like God is my only chance. If I don't change, I'm going to end up dead or in prison for the rest of my life. I am currently in the program awaiting treatment in Missoula County Jail. And I pray this letter reaches you. I hope there's someone there that fits the description of someone who could mentor and guide me to become a real Christian. I am writing this with a genuine heart and hope to hear from someone soon.
There's so many people like this. This is, this is my tribe, man. These are my people. <laughs> because I'm telling you, this guy kind of gets it more than a lot of people who are in the church. Where we get a little money, and we get a little success, and everything just becomes about ourselves. And we miss this because Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who recognize their need for God. This is why it just bugs me so much when people trash this place, not for my own ego, but they just, they don't even know. Like, this is a place that people like this feel welcomed. And I will always make it that place as long as I'm the pastor. And I'm going to go visit him. And you know what I'm going to tell him? The reason I've come to visit you, my friend, is so that you may know without a doubt that you have eternal life in Jesus Christ. And there is future for you, and there is promise for you, and there is hope for you. And I think a lot of us need to maybe write God a letter like this. I have on my sabbatical. I said, I'm tired of this. He said, I know. And he encourages us, and he lifts us up. If we could just get our focus off of all this other stuff and just get focused on how amazingly awesome our Savior is, it would change everything. Paul writes this letter, and he put it all together. It's assurance in eternal life equals confidence in your prayer life, which equals living by grace in your personal life. Bad, you can come on up. I'm going to read this again to you guys. 1 John 5, 13, he says, I have written this letter to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you will be assured and know without a doubt that you have eternal life. And then he says, we can experience the one who is true. We can experience it. And you young people, college kids, high school who are in here, there is so much doubt and confusion out there. There are so many voices. There's so many podcasts. There's so much stuff. And I'm just telling you, let nobody ever, ever cause doubt and how amazing your Savior is and your God is. Don't let anyone ever pull you away from this because it will be a hard life if they do. You need to know at a young age and an old age that you are of assurance of your salvation without a doubt. You are going to make it no matter what sin, no matter what sickness, no matter what trial, no matter what is in your life. It's on Christ to finish the job and he will. He's doing it in me and he's doing it in you. And when John says we can experience this, I really believe that's what baptism is. And today we're going to do some baptisms. I'm never going to fake church. I can't live that way. I'm never just going to come in here and it's going to be a show and all. It's just, I can't. That's stupid. I'm not going to do it. I want to feel it. I want to experience it. I want to know it. I don't want to just regurgitate what I read. I want to know it in my heart and have assurance of who my God is and who I am in Christ because we are royalty in Christ. And so what I believe baptism is, is I think that this was given to us not for God. I think it's for us. Not to fulfill this religious thing for God. We're constantly trying to appease God. I think he gave us baptism so we had a tangible moment where you can feel it and you can experience it and you can remember it. So when all the doubts come in and all the confusion comes in and all the hard times come in, you can remember, no, that was real. It happened. It was real. And that you can remember that you are secure in your eternal salvation. Your eternal life is secure in who Christ is, not in your accomplishments. Like little kids don't need to be proud, be proud of them just because they're accomplishments. It's because of you're his kid. That's why. And yes, there's repentance. We are to repent when we get baptized of the sins we have committed. But as I've already told you, in Aramaic, repent also means change the way you think about God. It means God is way better than we ever imagined or ever dreamed. This is a way that you can experience your old life going away. Even if you don't feel it, God says it happened. 
This is a way you can feel it. You can experience the death of your old life and put that crap behind you and start becoming who you're meant to be as ch children of God. It's a way you can experience the resurrection because when you go down, you die with Christ. When you come out, you are brand new. Getting baptized was a commandment. It wasn't a suggestion. So if you are a follower of Christ and you haven't been baptized, you're disobeying the Father. But again, it wasn't just for that. It's so you can have confidence. You can walk in confidence of who your daddy is and who you are. It's for us. And so I pray today that you make that choice to get baptized. We have a change of clothes for you. We'll, we're not gonna send you out wet. We got a change of clothes. We got towels. But I want this for you, and God wants this for you, because he wants us to experience this. And as we get older and more mature, let's just keep that salvation thing as the heart. And I want you to know today that this message was given so that you may know without a doubt that you have eternal life in the Son of God. Come get baptized, you guys.